Uh, there are there are a couple of questions that I'm going to lump together, even though they have uh, some elements that are different. I'm going to lump them together because they, they kind of come back to the same concept or issue. And uh, and I'll I'll try to get these. Great questions, by the way. I'm so excited to hear what uh, Steve Trammell has to say about all these. So I'm going to ask him. <laughs> <clears throat> Two of the questions come back to having the freedom to be innovative when it comes to worshiping God. And that, uh, you know, and sometimes worship may seem like it's um, self serving, but we're doing it because we love the Lord and because we're trying to be reverent toward Him. And isn't that really all that matters? It's our attempts. And, and I would say this about that I, I do understand that thinking. But I will tell you that God is pretty clear in some respects as to what he expects from us in worship. And if he's the God and we're the ones giving him what he wants and what he asks for and what in some cases he clearly states, I don't know that we have a lot of leeway in that. Now, there are clearly some areas and elements in which we have some, some freedom. Do we have a, certain, a select number of songs we're supposed to sing? or a certain time we're supposed to spend in prayer, or um, how are we supposed to take up collections from God's people. Though there are variations on that that could run the gamut of this room. Every person here could have a different idea on that, and I don't think that God is very clear about how those things are done. But that they are done is pretty clear. I will sing with the Spirit, sing with the understanding. I will pray with the Spirit, pray with the understanding. And uh, on, the, on the first day of the week, a collection is to be taken from among the saints. Those are, those are things that God's people did because God said, do those things. And I would, be, I would be very careful about trying to be innovative in those areas if, if I am looking at what God has asked for and I'm trying to give him something different or what I think may be better. And I'll give you the prime example of that. It goes all the way back to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. I will simply suggest this, that you go back and read this and see if this isn't true. I don't know what God asked for when he told Cain and Abel to bring worship to him. But whatever Cain brought displeased God. And even though Cain brought the best of his work in the ground, the fruits of his labor, it says neither Cain nor his offering were acceptable to God. And, and then God says, if you will do what's right, won't your countenance be lifted up? Won't you be happy if you do what's right? So there is inherent in that very concept that Cain gave to God something Cain thought God would like. And God was disappointed and Cain was angry. And, and I think from the very beginning, we have this great issue of life. Do I give God what I think he would like? Or do I work really hard to find out what he wants and give him exactly that? And you know you've probably been much more successful in purchasing gifts for people if you found out what they wanted and gave it, rather than that you guessed, I'll bet they'll really like this. Because you like it. And so you gave your wife for an anniversary two tickets to a NASCAR race. Because you love racing. And maybe she doesn't at all. So I think in this concept, do we have freedom to innovate when it comes to worship? I'd say yes and no. Yeah, you do have some freedom. Yes. But I don't think it's absolute freedom. Give God whatever you want. And he'll take it because he just understands your heart. Cain was upset that God didn't accept the sacrifice. He thought he would. He thought he would accept that. 
But Cain is guilty of will worship. It's what he wants to give, not what God gives. Abel pleases God not because he just happened to hit it right by a guess, but because he gave God what God had requested. And it made all the difference in both their lives. Now there's a, there's a question, uh, two questions again. Um, if, if my church is worshiping God improperly, uh, what are the implications concerning me personally? And, um, are, uh, well, I'll, I'll just answer that one first, and I'll get to the next one, which uh, may touch a little bit on that same thing. You know, I think the first thing is to make certain that what you're talking about is clear, that you really are worshiping with a church that is worshiping God improperly, whatever that may mean, whether it's some of the things we talked about tonight or something else. You need to make sure that that's really God's, displeasure with that worship and not just your own. But then if you're certain that that isn't pleasing God because God hasn't asked for that, and I think your first obligation is to try to talk to your brothers and sisters and the people who are part of your church fellowship and try to talk to them about that. <coughs> not throw up your hands and walk away, but express what is in your heart about that. And then if that doesn't work, then you have to make some decisions. Are these things serious enough that, that I'm, I'm certain God is unhappy with it? Well, if God is unhappy with it, then I don't want to be part of it. I would like to think that if Cain had said to me, Hey, Ralph, come on, let's go give this to God, and I was sure it wasn't what God wanted, I'm going to suffer the same consequences he suffers at the hands of God, if that's clear. Um, isn't it important how worship makes, makes me feel? And, and I would say, yes, that's important. Yes. But that's not the most important thing. I, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not really big on flowers for an anniversary. My wife's never given those to me. I do give her flowers. And I, and I don't really get too excited about the flowers. I'm excited about the fact that we've gone through another year of marriage. That's really really great for me. But I don't get too excited about the flowers. But I get really excited when I see her get excited about the flowers. There is a sense in which we receive a secondary emotional response because we know what we're doing is pleasing the one that we're doing something for. And I will tell you, I think that's ultimately what worship is about. If it's, if it's mostly about how I feel, if it's I just, I just don't feel that song today, right? I don't feel like that today. Isn't that hypocritical? No, that's not hypocritical. Oftentimes, our emotions follow our actions. You do the right thing, and you'll feel good about doing the right thing. And, and while ultimately doing the right thing makes me feel good, that's why that's important. So I need to make certain that what I'm doing is really pleasing God, and if he's the one smiling about it, then yes. My emotions are there. They will be there. Maybe not in absolutely every aspect at the same level, but they'll be there nonetheless. So I would say let's remember what the very word worship means. It's not about us. I mean, we have to be involved, but it's not about us. It's about the audience of God. And that's the most important thing. But when God is pleased, then we receive that. I, I think I could explain that best. One more point, and then I'll move from this. But if, if you're in a play, and you're performing for an audience, you're not doing the play because you receive incredible reward for doing the play itself. You don't come home from every rehearsal saying, it was incredible. That was wonderful. And I'll tell you what, I don't care if anybody comes to the play on Friday night. If the audience is empty, I'm going to get just as much out of it. That's not true. You won't. You want the audience out there. And you want that audience to just go and desert, saying, you're the best thing we've ever heard. This is wonderful. Best play we've ever heard. Clap, 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 and then standing ovation, and afterwards telling you, I've never seen a better flower on stage than you were. You had that big, big flower on your head, and your arms were out there like leaves, and you looked real. But when they're excited, you get excited. 
And their response to what you're doing brings on a secondary response for you. So that your emotions are involved in that. And that's what worship, it seems to me, is like and about. That the ungifted in your presence says, surely God is among you. Because you've done what you should do. All right. Um, <clears throat> Are there, are there elements of both forms that are sinful? Well, just as there are elements of both forms of worship, contemporary and traditional, that are right, there, yeah, there are both forms that, there are forms in both of them that, that can be sinful. Um, it's not inherently sinful because it's contemporary or traditional, but yes, those things can happen. Worship that doesn't bring God to the forefront is sinful, whether it's contemporary or traditional. Worship that doesn't engage us and bring us to that point, that's sinful worship. Worship that seeks to do what we want, whether God is involved or not in the decisions about that worship. Yes, those things can be sinful. Can you provide some examples? For me, it's not a matter of the particulars, it's a matter of the principles. And that's why I took you to 1 Corinthians 14. Is it edifying? Is it edifying if every person in here suddenly stood up and we said, say one thing, on the count of three, say one thing about God you'd like every person in this room to know. On the count of three. One, two, three. If everybody stood up and said it at the same time, is there any edification taking place there? I don't think so. There are some words that went out that were valuable, but it wasn't edifying because you couldn't decipher one thought from another thought. Well, if that's the characteristic of our worship and it's confusing, then it's sinful. On the other hand, if it's everybody just sit there and be quiet until we get through this. We're going through these steps, and when we get to the end of all the steps and check them off, we're done. Get out of here. That's not beneficial either. Worship has to engage people. And it has to engage our minds and our hearts to take us to the presence of God. And then explain the relevance of emotion and or feeling in our worship services to God. I think I've, I think I've dealt with that already. And uh, th that is very important for us. Would you condemn those who worship in sincerity but differ from your belief? Well, let me say this first of all. It's not up to me to condemn. That's not my place to do that. I mean, if you ask me what do I think about this or that, I could certainly offer you my opinion based on my understanding of the Word of God. But it's not up to me to say this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong except in terms of principles. And I think I've given you some of those principles already. And the fact that they differ from my belief isn't the critical thing either, because I'm not the litmus test for everything. But I'll tell you what it is, the Word of God. And everybody better be going to the Word of God as the litmus test for everything we do. Everything needs to be on the table before God. Is this what He wants from us? God loves us all. You and I love God, so why can't we both go to heaven? I hope we can. I really hope we can both go to heaven. I don't think I've said anything tonight that indicates I love God and you love God, but I'm going to heaven and you're not. I think we can both go to heaven. Let me tell you what's critical in this. It's understanding what loving God is. Because loving God is more than just my feelings about God. Loving God is about doing what God says. Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. So if I love God, I'm keeping his commandments. And you love God, you're keeping his commandments. I can just about guarantee you if we're doing that, I'll see you in heaven. And you may be more surprised to see me there than I am to see you there. But that's the key element. Loving God by keeping his commandments. That's how we demonstrate that. So it's not just about my feelings. And I do believe God loves us all. But let me ask this. If God loves us all, does that mean everybody's going to heaven? I don't think so. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said the road that leads to destruction, to hell and perdition, that road is wide and it is broad, and many are those who find it. And I think God loves those people, but he loves them with great despair in his heart that they're not doing what? Keeping his commandments. 
And finally, the last question. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, the passage I alluded to, or I actually just quoted, when the writer says, keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you, what traditions is he talking about? And does this verse apply to us today? Yeah, I believe it does in the same way that anything Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 applies to us in principle. Maybe not the particulars, the practices, but in the principles they do. I'm not sure I understand exactly what the traditions were, but it does, it does come on the ends of this section where Paul is answering some questions that the Corinthian brethren had of him about things they were doing. And it, it almost seems like a summary statement. Look, hold to the things I've been telling you. And I'm not sure I know what all those are, but he does go on to say, you know, I, I gave orders as I did to all the churches. He does say, there are things I've said over and over and over again. And those are probably the traditions. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I didn't satisfy the person who asked that question in terms of they were probably going to give us a list of what those traditions are. I can't really do that because I don't know what those are, to be fair to the passage. But Paul doesn't elaborate on what those are either. I think he's probably summarizing some of the things that he's been saying before. You've been very patient. I've kept you uh, six minutes longer than I intended to. I thought we'd be out of here by 8.30. It's, uh, it's 8.36. I really appreciate these questions. Those are very thoughtful. And I would be happy to stick around a few minutes and if you say, well, you missed mine altogether. I wasn't even asking that. Um, I'd be happy to take another stab at it if you'd like. But uh, thank you for listening so well tonight and thank you very much for the questions that you ask and giving me a chance to get those again. So uh, I just reiterate those words. Thank you all for your kind attention tonight. And uh, I, I, the, I hope the thoughts and the ideas that were presented were helpful and thoughtful. And they weren't intended to be disrespectful or dismissive of your involvement in your church in the area where you attend. What they were intended to do was to draw our attention back to the New Testament. Look at the first century church, as our brother has already said. I, I will say this, um, come back tomorrow night, we are going to take up the subject of gender roles in modern churches today. It's a provocative topic, and we want you to come back tomorrow, same time, 7.30, here at this place. But again, thank you for coming tonight. I'm going to ask Roger Smith to come and lead us in a closing prayer. Thank you. Okay, Mark, so. Could you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we've had the opportunity tonight to come together to listen to Ralph and uh, study these things about worship. We're grateful that you've given Ralph this great gift of storytelling, and we're grateful that he's been able to talk in such a plain and simple way that uh, words that are coming from your scriptures that we can understand. We're grateful for the, the congregation that has put this together, and we pray that good things will come from this meeting this weekend, and we pray that you help us all in thy service. We pray that we will go from here, glorify you in every way that we can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.